a workforce. Uh, one of the ways that I found over time, one of the, one of the ways to really um, give people an incentive to perform is, is when they made a mistake was to be merciful rather than to, rather than to be mean to them. Because just about anywhere you work, if you, if you make mistakes or if you have some problems, pretty much you can expect someone to be mad at you somewhere that you work for. Maybe not the person you work for, maybe the next one up, or maybe co-workers or something like that. But people don't necessarily expect to get mercy. And it's one of those interesting things, the way the Lord works, that you know, if you do show mercy, then what you get back from someone is, is, is a, in, a, in the work environment anyway, you, you get somebody that's, that's happy to work there. They realize that's a little bit different, and they, you know, they actually work harder for you. But not even looking to get something out of it, but do you enjoy being merciful? Um, grace, uh, give, being given the good things that we don't deserve. Do you enjoy um, being graceful? Do you enjoy perhaps get, you know, esteeming someone um, above yourself in something? Um, is that something that gives you pleasure or it doesn't have to be your way? Um, and as I say, that does that have to be my way all the time? Or is there, is, is there some grace that I can extend? Is there some understanding that I can extend in, in a particular instance? Forgiveness. You know, we realize what we've been forgiven and how much we need forgiveness each day and, and each month and how that forgiveness from the Lord just, it, you know, he's, he doesn't count it, he just keeps forgiving and forgiving, ready to receive us uh, when we repent from the things we've done wrong. But yet, forgiveness can be difficult for us, right? We can, we can want it, we can be necessarily praying for forgiveness in one moment and, and be unforgiving the next, but do you have joy in forgiveness? What about obedience? You have joy in, in learning the word of the Lord, to see what he commands, and then thinking about our own lives and are we obedient to the things that he commands? And are we, have we considered what's been given to us and what's been done for us along the lines of mercy and grace and forgiveness? Mm -hmm. And then think about what is the response that we're going to have? What do we want to choose before the situation arises? And then, uh, do we commit ourselves to do those things? Obedient in what would make sense in the mathematics of the Lord, or, or in the logic of the Lord, to be forgiving because we've been forgiven. And then, of course, trials. Do we rejoice in those? And, and that can be hard. And, you know, I'm not going to say that, uh, you know, the others, as I'm talking about them, you know, I can think of times that I've done, done a better job in those than others. But trials sometimes would be a hard thing to, to take pleasure in. Um, and, I, and I'd say that a lot of times during those things, the best I can, the best I can say is that I, a lot of times I'm wondering what the Lord wants me to learn. And I'm wanting to learn that quickly so the trial will be over. But along with trials, are we satisfied in what the Lord gives and what he provides? And, and, and those particular things. Or are we kind of looking around and saying, you know, well, you know, I know what I've been given here, and, and it was okay until I looked around and saw what, what somebody else has. Um, this particular one is, is an interesting one for me, um, you know, again, in, in, uh, in a work environment, because, you know, uh, you can, you'd be looking around and perhaps be interested in maybe a different job or some type of promotion or something like that, and look around and see that, you know, somebody else look around and go, well, I, you know, I, I wanted to get that job, I applied for it, that wasn't considered, or it was considered, but I didn't get it. And it can be kind of easy sometimes to forget, you know, I, I know what it's like not to have a job, to be looking for one. I don't want to take the one, I don't take what I want, I want to take what I've been given for granted, mm -hmm. but instead to look and say, you know, Lord, if, I, if you don't want me in that one, that's okay with me. But can we take joy in that? Can I take joy in what the Lord gives and what he provides? And then in that, that joy in that, in what he gives and provides, that's where contentment comes from. Paul will see in Philippians chapter 4, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere, in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And 
can you actually rejoice in that? that now that's that's going to be hard if we don't rejoice in the things of the Lord, but that's going to be easier as we rejoice in these other things, perhaps these easier things, and then looking to rejoice in everything that the Lord gives, provides, and allows. Now, if you think about it in the choice that we have between the things of the Lord or not, well, there's the things of the Lord, and then there's everything else, or there's the world, or there's the flesh. Um, what Solomon said is that as he pursued knowledge, and as he pursued science, as he pursued all the things of the world, he called them vanity. And what he means by that is that once you get it, the promise that it held is not really realized or fulfilled. And that actually what happens is it's, it's unfulfilling. But yet we get caught in this infinite loop of, or can be caught in it, of pursuing and pursuing and pursuing more of those things of the world, looking for that fulfillment, looking for the joy that it might bring, the contentment that it might bring, and it never brings anything. Now, what's interesting is uh, in, the, uh, in the world of psychology, one of the uh, uh, interesting things that uh, psychologists look at in, in the world of game theory is uh, that we'll look at, uh, and we look at Las Vegas, and we look at, at, we look at slot machines. And uh, you can take a mouse and, or some type of primate and you can uh, set them up in a situation where every time they're hungry they lick something or touch something and they get a reward from it, they get some food from it. <laughs> and then after a while you can starve the animal, come over and it'll push the button. If it doesn't get anything, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't react very well to it. However, if the reward is intermittent, if the animal pushes the thing, lifts the thing or whatever, and it gets some food and sometimes not, that is a powerful motivator, a powerful motivator in the animal world. Of course, if you, uh, you know, if you look into the world of psychology, it looks at animals and then projects the things onto how people uh, react. And I wouldn't necessarily ascribe to that as, as biblical, but uh, you know, maybe for some of us. But uh, <laughs> um, I think that, it, but it, but it is true that intermittent reward is a very strong motivator. As a matter of fact. Uh, what you'd find if you look if you looked in the, into the study of it is that next to fear, it's the strongest motivator that we can figure out in terms of games and rewards. That's why Las Vegas works so well. You know, you put the money in, you win a little bit, and it's you know, and you know, as they say, there's nothing like one money, right? And then you keep doing it more and more and more. And you can, if you've ever been there and looked around, you can just see see people doing all the gambling. Uh, of course, if you talk to anybody, they're all winners, but we know Las Vegas is very profitable. So that, that, that intermittent, that, that promise of reward, and a little bit of it you get, but not really and not fulfilled, there's no contentment in those things, yet the, the pursuit of it and the promise of it, empty as it is, can be a very strong motivator, and that would be the carnal mind that we're born with fits right in with that type of desire. The promise doesn't align with reality. There's a promise there, and we act as though it's true, but, but it's not. Uh, as Brian and I have talked about, you know, our ancestors came over here uh, thinking, you know, the roads were paved with gold. And, uh, you know, they weren't, but, but on they came. Um, instead of the promise or contentment at the end of that carnal rainbow, it's really disappointment. But the, in the mind of Christ, Rejoicing in the things of the Lord, what's there? Well, in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus himself said, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And what this talks about really is, it's, it's, it's talking about someone that, that is, is, uh, that's, that's passing out seed in those particular times, so you'd wear an apron and you'd hold it out here, be full of seed, and you might shake the apron or you might be throwing the apron. And the idea, the idea that you should understand there is, is that the further you throw the seed, the farther you walk, the more ground that you till, the, the bigger area that you cover, the bigger the reward you're going to get, the bigger harvest that you're going to get. And what this is saying here is that in the things of the Lord, basically, and this would be a wide, a, a wide 
sort of uh, ad adaptation of what's being taught here as opposed to just being given. But the things of the Lord have more reward in them than we can ever imagine. That the promise of those things, whatever we think those things are of the Lord, that we rejoice in them, and we do them because we think we should of what's been given to us, or if we do them because of what the Lord has done for us, whatever we think is the end result of it, it's much, much better. There's much more blessing in it. There's much more fulfillment in it. There's pure contentment in it. And there's joy in it. Re not only rejoicing in it, but the joy that you get back. That's the fulfillment. That's the kind of, of reward, or that's the kind of, of experience that Solomon was looking for, but he could never find. Mm -hmm. And you know, and he was the wisest man. Now, uh, Satan, what, what he would love to do is to get you looking at those things of the world, conform to the world, chasing after those particular things. And of course, if he can't, uh, let's, let's say you've accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, and that was a, a legitimate in your heart at the time. Well, you know, if he can rob you of your joy, that's good enough. You know, if he, if he can't keep you from being saved, if he can rob you from your joy, if he can rob you from the purpose that the Lord has, has, has gifted you to perform in your life, if he can do those things, if he can keep you from sharing the gospel with somebody, if he can keep you from coming alongside with, from, to, to somebody and helping, if he can keep you pursuing these things of the world, keep you a little bit unhappy, unfulfilled, good enough for him, right? Um, Philippians chapter 2, verse 21, we saw this, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ. And we have to ask ourselves, does that apply to us in a great way or a small way? And uh, as, I thought about, uh, as I thought about this this evening, um, before I spoke, um, something came to mind, and that is, you know, what would someone say about you, or what would someone say about me? They say, you know, well, what, what's Jay about? You know, or, or, or what, are, what are you about? Would they say, you know, well, you know, they're about the things of the Lord. Would, would your family say that? Would, would people that know you say that? Uh, would, would the people that, that you work with or, or hang around with or would your neighbors, would they say that? Would they look at you and say, you know, pursuing the things of the Lord there or different or set apart from everything else? And, and, and on top of that, seems to be happy doing it. Or, you know, would they say, you know, well, you know, Jay's up there talking, but uh, pretty unforgiving sort, uh, pretty, not very merciful person. Uh, I, don't, I don't connect when I look at him, the things of the Lord. I don't see joy in him. You know, something to, to think about in a way of, of just checking. You know, is it, what, what, would, what would happen there? I, uh, again, in another work store, I remember one time when I was first, I first started managing, and uh, I was sitting at home, and I, it just hit me, I, later I come to see it was from the Lord, that, you know, if, if, you know, if I died, what, what would people say? You know, that I helped? Or that they were glad to work with me, and I thought, you know, well, they'd say help probably, but they wouldn't say that I was. They were glad to work with me because I, I could have a heavy hand about things, and, you know, I had, I had somehow, you know, perverted the gifts I'd been given into thinking, you know, into expecting things out of others as opposed to helping others, and, you know, being merciful and kind about things, and so, you know, I I understand how that can be, but, uh, you know, we have to watch and assess ourselves as we're looking along here. You know, have, have I slipped anywhere in terms of these things of the Lord or the things of the world as something worked its way in to what I'm about? You know, I, I do want to, uh, in, in terms of trials, just mention, um, you know, James talks a lot about those, and he does talk about this, this in, a, in a way, this, this pursuit of worldly things. And in chapter 3 he says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown by the peace, sown in peace by those who make peace. So these things of the world, they don't align with that. But the things of the Lord are pure. They're peaceable. They're gentle. They're willing to yield. They're willing to be merciful. Full of mercy, it's even called out. And, and good fruit, there's good result from it. You know, it's, it's not like, I remember we, I worked with this person, and, and wherever this person went, just behind them was just scorched earth everywhere. And, you know, that's not, that's not good fruit. 
And of course, James, uh, in chapter 1, starting in verse 1, he says, of James, a bond servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And he goes on to talk about asking for wisdom. But in and of those things, and, and, and even on the trials, perhaps the toughest, one of the toughest things we have to go through, are we practiced enough in rejoicing the things of the Lord to find the joy in it? Because what it says here is, count it all joy. That's, that's a command. That, that's not a suggestion. And, and so we want to be on the kind of path that will take us there if we're not there. So, just remember as you're thinking about this particular verse, what are you rejoicing in? Are they the temporal things, the things of the world, or are they eternal things? And only eternal things, only the things of the Lord, give joy. Starting to look at, at verses 2 and 3. Beware of dogs, beware, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Or, watch out for those people who behave like dogs. They are evil and want to do more than just circumcise you. But we are the ones who are truly circumcised because we worship by the power of God's Spirit and take pride in Christ Jesus. We don't brag about what we've done. Now what Paul is warning people here about, the Philippians, is he's warning them about the uh, legalistic Jewish um, the Judaizers that were in Philippi and that were trying to come in and corrupt the teaching that was in the church. The, and in essence here, what he's saying is they were attempting to deceive the Philippians. So just to set this in a little bit of historical context, uh, in the history that we all know, but just to go over it, now from the beginning the gospel came to the Jew first. And, uh, and then we can see in Acts the first seven chapters deal only with Jew, Jewish believers. Uh, or Gentiles who were with uh, Jewish believers. And in chapter 8 and on, we'll see that the message went to the Samaritans. But um, it didn't cause that much of an upheaval since part of the Samaritans were partly Jewish. But when Peter went to the Gentiles, it created an uproar. We know all of that particular history. So uh, what, the, um, what, what the issue here is, is, is do you have to become a Jew first to become a Christian? And that was settled, um, and you can read about that in Acts. But there's, there still were dissenters after the decision was, was worked out in Acts, and having failed in, in their opposition to Paul uh, in, at Antioch and in Jerusalem, they followed him wherever he went and tried to steal his converts and his churches. And uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, Bible students or people that study the history of the church will call these false teachers who try to miss, mix the law and grace, Judaizers. And uh, the, actually, if you want to take a look at more of this, you can look at Galatians, which was uh, primarily written to, uh, to uh, work against this type of false teaching. So, Paul uses three terms to divide, excuse me, to, to, uh, to describe the Judaizers' dogs. Now, an Orthodox Jew would call a Gentile a dog, but here Paul is calling Orthodox Jews dogs. And as I mentioned earlier, a dog in that particular time, in that particular culture, was not the friendly little pet that we have now and, and uh, make a member of the family and you know, stay in the house and all that. They were usually scavengers that, that roamed the uh, city or whatever. They were mean. Um, they uh, you know, ate a lot of leftovers on the time of rotten things. They attacked each other and all the rest of it. You know, they, I, I call them, I like them now to be like a junkyard dog. That's what they meant here by dogs. So he's comparing the, uh, these false teachers to these uh, dirty scavengers that were contemptible to the Jews at that time. And uh, in the imagery that Paul's using, he's saying here that they were snapping at his heels and followed from place to place, barking their false doctrines. They were troublemakers, and they were carriers of a dangerous infection or unclean like these dogs might be, perhaps rabid. Mm -hmm. Now he also calls them evil workers. These men taught that the sinner was saved by faith plus good works, especially the works of the law. Of course, but Paul was saying that good works were really evil works because they were performed by the flesh, 
the old nature conformed to the world, and not the spirit. And that, that this type of, of uh, works, it glorifies the worker and not Christ. And isn't that interesting to think about? And, you know, sometimes it's hard enough for the things the Lord does for you not to glory in them. You know, not to, not to take what, what the Lord's blessed us in and glory in it ourselves, but instead give glory to the Lord. But instead, that, that if you think about this works thing, that really does glorify the person and not Christ. Now, of course, we know no one can be saved by good works, even good religious works, and salvation is the result of faith. We know that. Now, the mutilation here is Paul is using a pun on the word circumcision. Uh, and the, actually, the word uh, tra circumcision translates to be mutilation. The Judaizers taught that cir circumcision was essential to salvation, but Paul states that circumcision of itself is only mutilation. The true Christians experience the spiritual circumcision, a circumcision of the heart, we read about in Romans, and does not need a fleshly operation. Uh, circumcision, baptism, Lord's Supper, tithing, and any other religious practice will not save anyone from their sins. Uh, but, you know, in observing these things, it can be uh, a, a, a demonstration of one's faith, but it certainly doesn't save anybody. Only faith in Christ can do that. Now, in contrast, then, to these Judaizers, um, Paul describes the true Christian as the true circumcision. And in Romans chapter 25, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 25 to 29, he says, You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you, who, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that of which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Worshiping God in the spirit, we don't depend upon our own works there. Boasting in Christ, um, if you depend upon religion and what you've done, that's what you're boasting in. If you're boasting in the works of Christ, well, then that's different. And, of course, not having any confidence in the flesh. Now, basically, you can, sum, you can summarize what the Judaizers are doing here and, and what Paul would say in, in uh, Colossians chapter 2, uh, verses 22 and 23, is which all concern the things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Now, if you think about it, how futile is it uh, if you want to have the mind of Christ and you tempt yourself with the, with the carnal mind that we might have. But let's say, you know, let's see, what's a good thing to fight the carnal mind with? Well, how about something carnal? You now, that's just not going to work, right? And that's what he's calling out here. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I read just a, a little, uh, there was a little story about this. A lady was arguing with her pastor about this matter of faith and works. I think that getting to heaven is like rowing a boat, she said. One or is faith and the other is works. If you use both, you get there. If you use only one, you go around in circles. The only thing wrong with that, said the pastor, is nobody's going to heaven in a rowboat. So, you know, if you think about that, you know, that's, that's just about the, how, how futile uh, that particular thing is. Now, isn't it good that uh, we don't have anything like the Judaizers today trying to corrupt uh, faith or, or corrupt the Word of God? There's nothing at all like that coming along, is there? Uh, well, there is. There, actually, there is. Um, and that would be the emerging church. And I, I want to go through this a little bit. It's taking a little bit of a sort of a, a detour here in Philippians, but I do want to make sure I cover it. I mentioned Colossians 
Uh, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the visions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Now this emerging church, it's led by, uh, the movement's kind of led by a couple of gentlemen, Brian McLaren, who's written A New Kind of Christianity, and Rob Bell, who's written the book Velvet Elvis. And, you know, you just about would expect something against the gospel had to have Elvis in it. It just, it, it just fits in so many ways. Now, what the, what the under, underlying belief in the emergent church is that we have passed from a modern era to a post-modern era. And what that means is that there's no such thing as absolute truth. And it can be said this way, it's a little, it's a little like a... Uh, like something you might get in college or something, but it's postmodern in it, postmodernity, in contrast to modern modernity, rejects any notion of objective truth, and insists that the only absolute in the universe is that there are no absolutes. So that's the first thing. You know, there are no absolutes except, of course, they're absolutes. And then tolerance is the supreme virtue. And exclusivity is the extreme vice. Two more absolutes. Mm -hmm. So truth is not grounded in reality or any sort of authoritative text, but is simply constructed by the mind of the individual. And that's a quote from Michael Kruger, The Sufficiency of Scripture in Apologetics. So the irony of the emerging church is that, according to McLaren and Bell, and others is that postmodernism is the truth about the way things really are. And basically, it's a contradiction with all things in Scripture, the Word of God being truth, um, and, and things like that. And if you think about it, what it comes directly in opposition to, in Scripture, among other places, John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, you'd think if you were in direct opposition to anything Jesus said, that would be enough. But the emergent church is not about trying to, trying to find truth. It's not, it's not about that. It's about deception. So, um, what, it, what it comes to is it's, uh, it it's basically has a, a few meanings there. Um, they have a convoluted, not only do they have a convoluted set of beliefs, where there are no absolutes, but then they call out the absolutes that fit what they want to define but then they have a convoluted view of language. They're deconstructionist, and what that means is language cannot render truths about the world in an objective way, because according to their thinking, language is a cultural creation shaped by that particular, particular society and what it finds acceptable. What this nets out to be is the emergence saying we cannot really know with certainty what the Bible says, because it was written in another time, in another culture, and we have to look at it through our own lens, which invalidates everything that's in Scripture. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the emergents have found uh, that their own insights, of course, do have a universal truth that, span, that spans over time. So, once again, if you listen closely, it applied, what they're teaching applies to the Bible, and you can't believe any of it. Of course, their stuff, you can believe it. And the third one, and probably the most important one to understand is, Emergence insists on tolerance for everyone except evangelical Christians. <laughs> They're tolerant of all religions, even kind and loving, which is good, but intolerant and hateful toward those who believe the Bible is the Word of God and Jesus is the only way to the Father. In essence, Christians, conservative ones, are the bane of society. Now, Velvet Elvis, if you think about it, what a way to mock Christ in a way. What a way to look at, to think about, you know, that I, I read this book, I'm looking at that, that's going to become my, you know, part of my faith. And you know, think, think of exchanging Christ for Elvis. Yeah, a velvet one on top of it. So, um, in, uh, in Rob Bell's, uh, and where that came from basically is in Rob Bell, who wrote the book, he has a, a framed image of Elvis Presley in velvet. And those used to be kind of popular in the 70s, those of us that can remember that. And his point is that none of the two Velvet Elvises are the same. They're not exactly like but that's okay because they shouldn't be. They're all portraits, some better, some worse. And he compares this to the Christian faith. There are all kinds of versions out there, but no one version is right in comparison to the others. 
Rob says his Velvet Elvis is the version, if you will, of the Christian faith, and you can have your own. In his book, Velvet Elvis, he writes, I embrace the need to keep painting, to keep performing. I do not mean cosmetic, superficial changes. And he goes on to say, I mean theology, the beliefs about God, Jesus, the Bible, salvation, the future. We keep reforming the way the Christian faith is defined, lived, and explained. Now, I, I know as I go through this, I want to make sure that you just understand what this is so you can see it coming, especially where it affects friends, neighbors, loved ones, family members, especially young people, teenagers. But, but this is something to take away for, you know, if, if you do take notes, and that is tolerance is relativism, which means essentially anything goes. What's right for you is what's right, or whatever the culture, the culture says, the predominant uh, uh, um, emerging church culture is right and normal for that time. And what the tactic of that means is that Theological and moral political correctness is, they, they make it to seem like that's what the truth is. They try to make it to be cool and acceptable, especially young people. It's artistic, emotive, expressive. It's culturally relevant, especially with the youth of today. It's made to look attractive. But what underlies, underlies all of it is negation of scripture, and they're looking to either prevent salvation or to rob people of your joy. The, the emerging church are the Judaizers in terms of their intent, the same as, as back when Paul was writing Philippians. It's one of the subtle ways to be conformed to the world. Remember Romans 12, 2? And they'll be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, uh, doctrine, of course, as we know, is important to our faith because we understand it, we adhere to it. It's what God's telling us about himself and just as important, telling us about ourselves. Our faith affects how we live our daily lives. We have in there the essential doctrine elements that we believe in that make us a Christian. And if we reject these essential doctrines, of course, we reject the historic, biblical, proven Christianity and for those that aren't saved, they can find themselves rejecting Christ in, in this movement. Now, emergents also try to argue against the Trinity, in essence saying that somehow this was, a, this was how things were determined by people way back then, and they've come up with these words to talk about God. And so, you know, if there's no Trinity, of course, Jesus can't be God. That's basically the underlying effect there. Attack the Trinity. Jesus, Jesus is then not God. They try to attack the virgin birth in an indirect manner. They say that even if it's believed, it shouldn't matter how we love God or shouldn't matter to your faith. What does it really matter? But of course, Jesus can't be who he said he is if without the virgin birth. And what they postulate in the book and in their teaching is that they say, well, what if he did have a natural father? And what if he, you know, if they could find something of his, his bones or something, and do a genetic code on it, and you had, you know, and this type of thing there. And basically, what they're trying to do is, is to uh, undeify him. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing they do is they try to attack, well, not the last thing, but one of the major things, they try to attack the resurrection of Christ. Now, as we all know, the resurrection is the cornerstone of our faith and the central message of the gospel. <coughs> Christian faith stands or falls on the resurrection. And Jesus is declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Romans chapter 1, verse 3. Concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, he was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God, with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. For I delivered you first... Of all that I, 
For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. And then, of course, you can read more about that in Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 1. And, in, and when you get to verse 7, um, the, uh, actually starting in verse 6, the angel says, He's not here but risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, and this is Christ, The Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Now what emergence will say about the resurrection where our faith stands or falls on it. Every, Jesus said, if I can do that, you can believe everything else that I say about myself. The word to say, everybody's God in the first century had risen from the dead. To claim as a, a resurrection has occurred was nothing new. To try to prove there was an empty tomb wouldn't have gotten very far for the average Roman citizen uh, in the Roman Empire. They had heard it all before. Now remember, in the story in the Gospels, that... The, the Jews actually were worried about that he was going to raise again. They posted the guards and the rest of it to actually prevent it. But all of this comes together in terms of looking at it that you know, we have our Judaizers of this day and, and, to say, and, to, and knowing this about the Word of God. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But yet they're trying to corrupt that, and, they're, and where they're most effective are with young people and using music and other types of things, sort of presentations for service and the rest, corrupting the word of the Lord, substituting um, doctrine that sounds really nice, tickling to the ears, especially of young people, and yet it's false, false, false. If they can prevent someone from coming to Christ, that's great. If they can ruin someone's life in terms of joy, a Christian that's there, well, that works too. They're trying to corrupt the Word of God. Now, and if you think about it really, the Word of God, the acts of the Holy Spirit, that's what provides joy. And if they can corrupt someone's walk, they can get your eyes off the things of the Lord, they can put your eyes on things of the world or something false in terms of that religion. Again, there's no, there's no joy there, there's no happiness. It's a pursuit of something empty that's never going to come about. Just, it's, it's another pursuit like Solomon had. There's promise to it, but there's no fulfillment to it. There's no contentment to it. There is no joy in it. So, moving on to Philippians chapter, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 4, 5, and 6. For I might also have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of the Hebrews. Concerning the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. Or, in the contemporary English version, although I could, others may brag about themselves, but I have more reason to brag than anyone else. I was circumcised when I was eight days old, and I am from the nation of Israel and, a tribe, and the tribe of Benjamin. I am a true Hebrew. As a Pharisee, I strictly obeyed the law of Moses. And I was so eager that I even made trouble for the church. I did everything the law demands in order to please God. So, in verse 4, what Paul's saying here is that these Judaizers were men that were boasting in their fleshly advantages of being a Jew over, and in terms of saying something, you have to be a Jew first to be a Christian. And as he says, as, he, as Paul says, comes against this really, what he's, what he's talking about is, is if they could brag about whatever it is they were bragging about, being a Jew, he could brag even the more so. And he was going to, he'll show in these verses to a preeminent degree that he possessed all the natural attributes that he had based upon his Jewish birth. And, and, and of course, which the Jewish nation glory, gloried in. And then he would have made choices about the particular life that he led that would even surmount most of those or all of those uh, choices and the type of, of station that he had in life that, that these Judaizers had. Um, what, what Paul does here is, is uh, I read, is that uh, the whole stock and trade of the self-righteous Pharisee is inventory here. He delights to display, and we'll read about this, the filthy rags and make a show of them openly. And 
Paul here, as he talks about the pride of ancestry, the pride of orthodoxy, the pride of activity, and the pride of a false morality. If you think about it, that's, that's really the end of, those, of the, the carnal natural mind pursuit, isn't it? That, that's the vanity. It's empty. You know, it, it's, uh, you know, I used, they used to say in Southern California, you know, the empty suit. Looks good on the outside, nothing on the inside to help. And, uh, and that's this, these promises are empty. They look, they look nice, but then, you know, you crack them open and there's nothing there. And we just keep pursuing those things if we're not careful. Uh, Paul calls out these natural advantages that he had by birth. Uh, first one, circumcised on the eighth day. He was a Jew. Uh, not an Ishmaelite or not a convert. And this is according to Leviticus 12.3. He's the stock of Israel, a member of God's chosen earthly people, and an heir to God's covenant. So he had the same uh, inheritance that the Jews had. He was the tribe of Benjamin, a tribe that was considered, considered uh, part of the aristocracy and leadership of all the tribes. One that gave Israel its first king, Saul. It was the tribe that aligned itself with faithful Judah when Israel was divided in the time of Rehoboam. Number four, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He belonged to that segment of the nation that held its original language, customs, and usages. Now, some Jews at this time were ashamed of that practice, and they tried to take on a lot of the things of the Greeks. Even to, as I read, um, somehow having surgery to be uncircumcised. And Paul here is, now Paul is saying, look, look, of these natural things, and some of them, you know, being a Benjamite and the rest, I'm, I'm either, I have the same things most of, as, of you, or even better, being a Benjamite. And now he says, concerning of the law of Pharisee, the Pharisees have remained orthodox, whereas the Sadducees had abandoned that doctrine of the resurrection. Paul was an elite among elites, as viewed by the Jews. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, Paul sincerely thought that he had been doing God's service when he attempted to wipe out the Christian sect. He saw it as a threat to his own religion, and he sought to exterminate it. And he, he talks a little bit about this, this type of zeal in uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. I bear them witness they may have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And in this beautiful way of laying this out, Paul says, I grant that you have zeal and that you do have care for the rituals and ceremonies. And I grant that you had that intolerance for other doctrines like I had, and that's good. But he's saying, you know, but your zeal has no truth. And you're not, none of these things that you, as a man, as the Jewish tradition, account for righteousness, they're not righteous in the eyes of the Lord, as we know. And then, of course, concerning that righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. Now, Paul's not saying here because he kept the law that he's blameless. And he'll confess in Romans that such is not the case. Um, he speaks of himself being blameless, not sinless. Um, Paul claims he didn't violate any part of the law, and we can say that he didn't. Uh, that he was careful, in other words, to do the, the, the Levitical type of things, sacrifices and the rest. He'd been a stickler in seeking to observe the rules of Judaism to the letter. That's what he counted for uh, blamelessness or righteousness. And again, this is Paul speaking about himself before the road to Damascus. Thus, as to birth, pedigree, orthodoxy, zeal, and personal righteousness, Saul of Tarsus was an outstanding man. An outstanding man going straight to hell in the fast lane, in the diamond lane. <laughs> now, what he had is this righteousness achieved by the standards of men, yet falling short of God's holy standard. So, if anyone could claim themselves to be righteous by these particular standards, um, law-keeping and works of the flesh, it would have been Paul. He would have been more authorized or more qualified in the eyes of the Judaizers, in the eyes of the Philippians, to make this claim than anybody else. 
And yet coming up, Paul is now going to reject all of that confidence that comes from the works of man, from the flesh, and from the traditions that had arisen out of the Jewish faith. Paul will say in so many words, the things that he thought were right, the things that he accepted as being right, they had a pleasure to them, they had a righteousness that seemed right to him, but they're not. And they were not. And if you think about whenever Paul describes this former life, he talks about really the, the, as, as, the, the, what he got out of it was the pursuit, the pursuit of the Christians. That's what gave him um, happiness. And it gave him joy, it didn't give him fulfillment. It was, it was just a vicious cycle. He says about he's just breathing contempt for them as he chased them down. But what he was missing out on in his life was joy. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and goes on. But the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Joy only comes from the Lord. And for us, it comes with first that mind of Christ that Paul's been talking about. And then it comes from the rejoicing in the things of the Lord and the pursuit of those things. Again, back to that seed sower, sowing out all that God intends us to do through obedience, through love, Amen. through through taking joy in what He has us to do, and then that fulfillment that comes back 10, 20, 50 fold, that joy that sustains us through all these things. When I mentioned earlier, do we take joy and rejoice in the things of the Lord? It, it's kind of it's another one of those infinite loops. You know, if we intend, if we do those things and desire to do those things, we're filled with joy, the fruit of the spirit, and then we have more joy in doing what we do, and then we do more things, and we get more joy, and then we have more joy in doing what we do, and it just keeps getting. It's it's a convergent thing in our fellowship, closer and closer and closer to the Lord, happier and happier as we do it. Or you know, you can, you can worry about pursuing the things of the world, uh, get farther and farther away, perhaps even become self-righteous in some way, and miss out on, on either the joy in your life, or, or for those that aren't saved, of course, missing out on being saved entirely. So, coming up we'll see what Paul thinks now. All these things that he held so dear, we're going to find out what he really thinks of them, looking, looking back on them now with that mind of Christ. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, thank you for Paul and his life, Lord. Lord, help us to have that mind of Christ, Lord, that Paul talks about. Help us to seek it and desire it. Lord, we pray that you would even give us more of that mind now, tonight, and through this week, Lord. And we pray that we would have a heart that desires to be obedient, a heart that desires that knows what you want to tell us about yourself, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and ourselves, Father. Help us to want to have that mind of Christ, but help us to desire to rejoice in the things that you rejoice in. Lord, we pray for that joy that you promise. Lord, we ask for hearts that want to do those things that you set out for us to do. Lord, help us to choose these things first and foremost. Lord, we look forward to how you'll answer this prayer in each of our lives. And we give you thanks, Lord, not only for all these wonderful promises, for your mercy and your grace, Lord, but, to, but to be gifted, Lord, and to be chosen to serve you in some way, in any way. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.